to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. There's a topic in uh, the Follow Me series. It's not always fun to deal with. But it's pivotal, and I believe it's more important than what was dealt with even last week. As Christ has brought us along this journey, each and every time He's giving us something that applies to our walk, to our lives, and, and invigorates us with the truths that are contained here in the Scriptures, to the end that we would do them, and we would grow, and we would be that light into the world. So here, we've just had that wonderful confession of Peter, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And then him professing that, Christ began to say to his disciples, teach no man this thing. Why? Because I'm going to teach it to them. Each one of them individually and uniquely and personally, I will show who I am to them. I trust that this last week you spent some time wondering to yourself, who do I say that Jesus is? Who is Christ to me? Christ showed his desire to be revealed in each one of us in a peculiar and in a personal way, a unique way, something special. God knows the very numbers of the hairs on your head. That's how important you are to him. Okay, You're not just another person. You're not just another face in the crowd. No, God knows you. He loves you. He formed you in the belly and fashioned you for the particular purpose that he has for you today. We know the Apostle Paul is one of the greatest Christians of all time, penning most of the New Testament, spreading the gospel farther and planting churches than anyone that we can behold in the scriptures. Paul's greatest desire after all that he had done and during all that he was doing was to know him. He wanted to know Jesus. He wanted to know him and the power of his resurrection, that resurrecting power that he has available to those that believe and trust him by faith. But he also said this, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings. We can't fellowship with Jesus in his godliness. We can't understand and experience what it's like to be God. But he came to this earth to fellowship with us and experience what it's like to be man. That he could know us and understand us and, and, and truly redeem us, being one of us. When he did that, he walked a suffering path that God had never experienced before. And then Jesus says that saying to us, follow me. Now when Jesus ended his life, he was more marred than any man. He was beaten, spat upon, he, he, was, he was barely a skeleton of a frame of a man. Not a bone broken, but everything but. And he says, follow me. And the Apostle Paul says, Oh, that I could know and have fellowship with him in his sufferings. Christ made that available. He came and suffered with us. And we can fellowship in the same suffering that Christ went to by simply yielding ourselves over to it and following him. Where did Jesus' life end? Not in fame and not in glory. That happened after he passed away on this earth. His life in this earth and in this plane ended with suffering unspeakable. And if we're following Christ, guess where we're headed? Okay? But that shouldn't just discourage us. That should, also, that should actually encourage us. Because we can experience the same thing that Christ did. And we can have fellowship with him in it. And I don't know about you, but in the times of suffering, in the times of, of darkness, when you're just about to give up and crumble under the weight of it all, it's almost those moments that you're never closer with God. Some of my hardest struggles and my most difficult times in my life were the times I felt closer to God than ever. I had fellowship with Him in His suffering. It may be emotional, it may be physical, it may be spiritual, the suffering that we go through. But Christ experienced them all. And he knows 
your frame and he knows what you've been through and he knows what you're going through and he wants to be with you in those things and have fellowship with you in them. Paul found a special connection with Christ in the pain that he experienced in his name. When we look at scenarios like I was telling you I'm reading through the book of martyrs and I'm seeing moms have their seven, eight, nine-year-olds ripped from their hands and they're beaten and they're they're scalped even and they're told to denounce Christ and their moms are just there with a somber face saying you can do it sweetheart hang in there don't go to them for anything look to your savior encouraging their children through the pain and suffering that they're going through and no doubt there's a thorn going through the mom's heart at the same time but for the end that is set before them, they look to that and, and they look to the glory that shall be revealed. And they also, in a way, envy their child who is suffering for their Savior and fellowshipping with him at that. We wonder about the apostles who get thrown in prison and beaten and cast out and then they're jumping for joy that they're accounted worthy to suffer for his name's sake. Follow me suffering. It's not the best topic it's not the most comfortable topic but it's something that god gives to us here in this chronology of the teachings of matthew and i believe it fits in perfect what do we have jesus saying i'm going to reveal myself to you then jesus saying suffer with me next we're going to see jesus transfigured changed before them and glory is revealed to them face to face and that saying we're going to experience christ showing who he is we're going to suffer with him onto glory. That's the path that we're walking as we go through this study. So there in Mark or Matthew chapter 16 and verse 21, we'll get into it. It says, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised again the third day. The Lord is revealing to his disciples now his own purposes, where he's going, what he will be performed in the what will he be performing in this life? And that is what? Suffering unto glory. His disciples are being shown that, hey, these elders, these chief priests, these religious hypocrites, the scribes, they will betray me. They will force me to suffer. They will kill me, but I will be raised up in the last day. You can keep your finger there in Matthew. Go to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. And it shouldn't be some surprising thing. It also shouldn't dishearten us to see the Lord presenting such a topic. He's showing his disciples. He's teaching them. He's going to suffer. But that last sentence there often gets missed and raised again the third day. He had to suffer and be killed in order to rise up again. This was the very purpose for which Christ came. He's just finally gotten there. And no doubt it's hurtful to his disciples. In John chapter 12, look at verse 23. The Bible says, And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Sounds really good to hear that Jesus is going to be glorified. And the follower of Christ the same. You will be glorified. But that next verse, truly, truly, unless the corn of wheat first fall to the ground and die, it abideth alone. It won't do anything. It won't perform its task. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. It had to die first. Jesus is the same. He had to suffer. Verse 25, it says, He that loveth his life shall lose it. He that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. Okay, now, hating your life isn't just 
moping about going, oh, I hate my life, like an Eeyore kind of thing, right? Just, oh, my life is so miserable and complain. That's pride, okay? When everything is so bad and your life is so miserable and whoa, whoa, whoa is me, that's just, that's just pride and nothing else. I don't need to take you to the other scriptures, but I can show you that hateth there simply means to love less, right? Jacob, did, in dealing with his wives, he, he loved the one and hated the other, but it says plainly that he loved them both. He just loved one less. And this is what's indicated here. If you love your life, you'll lose it. But if you hate your life in this world, you shall keep it unto life eternal. Our goal is to love our life less going on in this world and love life eternal more and more and more and more. That ought to be where our love is hid in Christ, in the hope of glory, in the life eternal that he is. Don't love this life and this world and your job and your position and your prestige and everything going on here on this dirt we call earth. Love life eternal. Verse 26, it says, If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. And if any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? Watch this. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So the whole purpose of Christ's coming was to this end that he would be as that corn of wheat that died and brought forth much fruit. That he would love life eternal more than this life. That he would follow or he would lead his servants in a direction that they ought to follow in. And that's one of all of those things encompass death unto life eternal, dying unto bringing forth much fruit, being glorified but only after suffering what he's about to suffer. For this cause, Jesus came. You can turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. For this cause, Christ came, and that's to walk that road to the cross. Jesus saith, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. We have to ask ourselves, if we're following Christ, are we going to be suffering as well? Is that included? Yes, it is. Where Christ goes, we ought to go. And that's what he just said in in John chapter 12. If any man serve me, let him follow me. Where I am, there shall also my servant be. Even unto the death, if any man serve me, him will my father honor. So we have lots of anecdotal evidence of Christians suffering through time. We, we've we seen Christians suffer in, our, suffer in our time and in our day. We've seen it on the news. We've seen it, we've seen it reported abroad. We've read it in books and in the history books. There's lots of anecdotal evidence. Book of Martyrs shows the trail of blood throughout history of Christians suffering at the hands of governments and peoples that hate them. Hebrews chapter 11 gives us some scriptural witness. In verse 13 it says, From henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Wrong chapter. Hebrews chapter 11. My apologies. That's a good word too though. Verse 13. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 verse 13, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly, where God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. And there is that verse fulfilled, I have both glorified it and will glorify it, being the name of the Son of God. And if any man serve him, following in the path of his Son, the Father will certainly honor him. God is not ashamed to be called your God. God is happy and rejoices to be called your God, being mindful of the better country that awaits for us, looking unto life eternal and more and more every day desiring that, putting this temporal world behind us and thinking not on it 
Set your affections on things above and not on things of the earth. Now this is referring to specifically Abraham, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Noah, and all of these great men, Enoch and, and Abel, these, these elders that obtained a good report through faith, looking for that wonderful country, that eternal life that is beyond this world, that wonderful city that is in the other world after we face the natural death here. They died in faith, and they are certainly named in the scriptures. There are also those that aren't. Verse 32, we'll continue on down to verse 40, and it says, And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. And those are all wonderful, blessed things that happen through faith. Good things that we can rejoice in. But then there's the suffering. And others were tortured. Not accepting deliverance. In other words, facing the torture. Facing the suffering. Deliverance could come how? Re re recant. Denounce your Christ. Deliverance could come how? Throughout history. By, by not accepting water baptism and letting sprinkling happen. Deliverance could ha come how? Deliverance could have been given to people throughout history if they would have just eaten a cookie and drank a little juice. But these did not accept deliverance through their torture. Why? That they might obtain a better resurrection, rewards to come from God as he looks at them and says, I'm not ashamed of you. I will honor you. Thou beloved saint, son of mine. Verse 36, it says, And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. We're not there yet. I believe the time is coming. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. They were tempted. Were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, Look at this verse. This is God almost just the Father putting his thoughts in there of whom the world was not worthy. The world isn't even worthy to house tortured saints, scourged saints, slain, stoned, and destitute saints that gave their faith to God and didn't accept deliverance from the sufferings that God put in front of them. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth, just like those that acknowledge that they're not mindful of that country. They want one better. And so they live roaming about strangers and foreigners in this life, in deserts and mountains, caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, Receive not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. These had a promise and they will receive the promise in due course. We're the same way. Today we've been given a promise, the earnest of the inheritance that comes by the Spirit of God dwelling within us. We haven't received it yet, but we can still live by faith and act by faith and follow these same footsteps by faith. And these are the same footsteps that I believe Jesus Christ walked before us and many saints of old. We have an obligation to suffer in that same way. And we have a glorious opportunity to suffer in the same way. And I believe when you suffer, you'll find wonderful and blessed fellowship with Christ and you'll be on your way to being made a fisher of men. We continue on in Hebrews chapter 12 in the first four verses there. It says, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, we have all of these testimonies of saints in the scriptures and history indicating those that have walked the path after Christ before us. It says, Let us lay aside every weight, 
and the sin that doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. You know that saying? Look at all these saints that have gone through walking that path, and you are there too. So lay aside the sin. Lay aside this world. Lay aside its allurement and its temptations. And run the race in the direction of these saints that went before you, this wonderful cloud of witnesses. Follow me, Jesus says. Run with patience the race that is set before you. Looking unto, verse 2, Jesus. Looking after him. Following after him, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. Being lifted up there to the right hand of God came through his endurance of the cross, the shame that he faced at that time. As the author and finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ says, look to me, run with patience that same race. Verse 3, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself you imagine the people that stood across from Jesus and said, he's a liar, he's a blasphemer? <laughs> what a contradiction of sinners that Jesus had to endure. Consider that lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Look at this. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. But we certainly have examples of those that didn't accept deliverance that suffered, that bled, and died as a result of the suffering that went before them, following after their Savior, refusing to deny Him, because denying Him at that time would certainly be a sin unto them. You've not yet strove unto sin, but glory to God, that day may come. Therefore follow Him, and in doing so, reveal His purpose in you. Fulfill His purpose in you, is what Christ wants ultimately from each and every one of his saints. Look over at 1 John to the right in your Bible. 1 John chapter 3. We're talking about the Lord's purposes here. How he walked before us where we ought to walk as well. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil... For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Christ's purpose in coming was providing that men could be born of God and not commit sin as a result of what he did in destroying the works of the devil. You can go back to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Now this wasn't what was expected of Jesus. What was expected of Jesus, I could read for you in Acts chapter 1 real quickly. Acts chapter 1. What was expected of Jesus in Acts chapter 1 verse 6 is when they were therefore come together, they asked of him saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom unto Israel? The expectation of the Jews and even his disciples after Christ died on the cross, was buried and rose again, the first thing they ask him, are you going to set Israel free? Are you going to restore the kingdom again? Are you going to put these Romans out of our land? They wanted their conquering Savior, but instead they got a suffering servant. Jesus says, It's not for you to know the times and the seasons that the Father hath prepared in his own power. The time is not yet. You're confused. The accusation over in John chapter 18, I can take you there. John chapter 18. My apologies. You can turn there. John chapter 18. And in verse 29, the expectation of the Jews was a conquering Savior. And the accusation came from his accusers of the same. John chapter 18. And in verse 29, Pilate then went out unto them and said, what accusation bring ye against this man? They answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, 
we would not have delivered him up unto thee. Then Pilate said unto him, Take ye him and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake signifying what death he should die. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall, and called Jesus, and said unto him, Art thou king of the Jews? There's the accusation that he would come as this conquering savior. Verse 34, Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered unto me, have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answering, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews, and saith unto them, I find no fault at all in him. There in that passage, we find the same accusation the Jews brought to Pilate. He says he's a king. He says he's our king. He's going to up, up, up evil this place. He's going to turn things up. He's going to rile it up. He's going to push the Jews, lead some sort of rebellion. But Jesus Christ indicates that his goal and his love and his heart is not for this world. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, amen, but his dominion is not of this world. His kingdom is not of this world. And therefore he says, that's why there's no one here fighting for me. That's why I'm standing before you, dumb. That's why I'm going as a sheep to be slaughtered, a lamb to be slaughtered. And Pilate's only observation is, I find no fault in him, especially dealing with what they were accusing of him, him of. In Acts, his disciples thought he would come and conquer a nation of this world. The Jews accused them the same, that he would come and take over a nation in this world. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 22, even Peter hearing Jesus say that he's going to suffer. He's going to be entreated wrongfully by the elders, the chief priests, scribes, and he will be killed. Peter took him, in verse 22, and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Peter was expecting to be led unto liberty. Peter was expecting to be leading an overthrow of the government at that time. Instead, his Savior laid down his life, and he was revealing this to them. And Jesus says to Peter, Follow me, as he says to all of us. You can see then that the focus of Jesus was not of this world at all. He had no love for this world. He did not want to conquer this world. He, thought, he sought after that same heavenly kingdom, which is the same thing that the saints in Hebrews 11 sought after. It's the same thing we have to seek after. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Here Peter contends with Jesus at hearing his statement. Here Peter contradicts him. He even rebukes the Lord. Peter's hope and expectation, his plans for Jesus was that there would be blessings on this earth but that was so far from the truth that Jesus rebukes Peter as if he were the very devil Peter was so far away from the will of Christ in that statement that Jesus comes to him in verse 23 but he turned and said unto Peter get thee behind me Satan thou art an offense unto me for thou savorest not the things that be of God but those that be of men. Indicting Peter in the same. Peter, I'm going to do these things. To this end I came. This is my purpose 
for even coming to this world was to suffer, be killed, that I would be raised again the third day and go into glory that way. And you just want glory in this life. He was savoring things of this world. He had a heart towards it, a focus, a meditation upon it, a lust for the things of man, exhibiting the true nature of Satan here, Peter was, as a believer. Carnality. Carnality is what crept into Peter's heart. And carnality can definitely creep into ours. What is carnal, what is temporal here in this world, I believe is actually less real than what is to come. We're trapped in this three-dimensional frame. We're trapped in this world of carnality. There is something greater. We seek a greater kingdom, a better kingdom, is what we look forward to. This world is the devil's dominion. This is where he tempts. This is where he brings the lust of the eyes, the lusts of the flesh, and the pride of life in order to trap and trip and, and, and trick men and lead them in the paths of destruction. Look at his temptation of Christ himself back in Matthew chapter 4. In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 3. When the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Remember, Jesus was in hunger after he had fasted for a time. And so the devil offers, offers him what? Carnality. A stone to be made bread. Command, Son of God a meal to be placed before you. What else does he come back with him? Come to him with, tempting him. Verse 5, The devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on the pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. There's the pride of life he tempted him with. Offering him the opportunity to have glory of men as a result of this great spiritual salvation that came as the angels swooped up and carried him away and saved him. Carnality is what's being put before him. Verse 8, And the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. The, uh, the devil offers things, offers possessions, offers glory of the world. Verse 10, Then Jesus saith unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. There's Deuteronomy thrown back in the devil's face, fighting carnality with spirituality, truth from the word of God. And the response there, back in chapter 16 of Matthew, very similar to what Jesus gave to the devil himself during his temptation at the beginning of his ministry. Get thee behind me, Satan, Thou art an offense to me. Thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those things that be of men. Remember, the devil left him for a season back in chapter 4, and here he is again, working through Peter. That statement, Be it far from thee, O Lord, what? To fulfill your purpose? Be it far from thee, what? To, to, to die as intended and raise incorruptible, redeeming all men unto me? Be it far from thee, O Lord, what? To settle for less and have kingdoms of this world? And prosperity here in this life, settle for less, be it far from thee. And you've heard the same temptations. You've heard them in your heart. You've heard them from your family. You've heard them from your friends. You've heard them from the news and outside sources. you got to think of your future. What about your children? Invest. All of these temptations here to have some sort of security here, but our savorous thing, our, our desire, I just invented a word, our, our, our heart needs to be towards what's to come and not on things of the earth. Say the same thing when tempted with carnality. Get thee behind me, Satan, for I desire to have my affections on things above, not on things of the earth. 
And that's the temptation that's always going to be given us from the devil, to think carnally as opposed to spiritually. Now Christ, and we read about it in Hebrews chapter 11, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. And I believe that we have the same power. If we put our focus on things above and not on things of the earth, if we think more about the joy that is set before us, we can endure much more down here on this earth. For the joy that was set before him, for Jesus it was the kingdom. For Jesus it was you. For Jesus it was the salvation of the whole world available to them if they would just receive it. That was the joy that was set before him. And because he had that focus, he endured things in this earth. And we ought to be the same way. For the joy set before us, for the heavenly promise, for the new Jerusalem, for that, that city set on a hill that we look forward to, for the joy that set before us, no tears, no crying, that promise, we ought to look at that and in perspective be willing to suffer some things in this world. Willingly set the joy before you and therefore you won't be shaken by anything on this earth anything on this earth you can endure your own cross even as jesus says follow me take up your cross and follow me and that's what he begins to highlight to his disciples verse 24 then jesus said unto him or unto his disciples if any man will come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me Follow me, Jesus said way back, and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me here, Jesus says. Take up your cross, and you'll be glorified. This is a bottom line truth of discipleship. Putting down things of this earth. Setting your affections on things above. Denying self. Taking the cross and following me. Loving your life much less than the life that Christ offers that's eternal, that hope of glory. We need to realize, we need to be resolved of that same truth. We need to be abandoned to any other motivation, any other desire, any other goal, any other lifestyle change that we're trying to, anything that we have in this world, it's good to have goals, it's good to plan, it's good to, it's, it, these are good things, but they need to be hated in comparison with the motivation and the calling of your own cross and the calling of that cross is that you would bear it, that you would die for it. We need to, as believers, believe so intensely and without wavering in heaven above, and the promises that are coming, and the joy that's set before us, that essentially we're reckoned to be dead already. It doesn't even matter what happens down here. It's of no consequence. We don't regard this thing. We savor us the things that be of God and reject all things that be of man. That's how we have to be in spirit. Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life that I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the eternal life that we need to look for. We're dead already. Crucified with Christ. We've taken our cross and we're marching on a path which leads us to glory. And that's it. Verse 25, whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. What do we need to preserve that's here in this world? Why do we need to preserve something that is going to vanish and fade away? Something that is going to melt with a fervent heat? Preserve your life? Save your life? How about just give your life wholly unto God and let Him do what He needs to with it until it expires and goes the way of all men, where it ought to be? That's the resolve that believers need. Resolve that you're dead. Believe that you're dead. Be crucified with Him. Nevertheless, live. Your life is hid with Christ in God, and that is a present truth. And that's why Christ in teaching this was so sharp and stern with Peter, because Peter had fallen from that truth. He had just had this wonderful, great revelation of who Christ is to him, and then he got his focus off the Son of God and started focusing on this world. But God, we need to take over Jerusalem. But God, we need to... We need to overthrow the government. But God, we need to fight for our rights. But God, we need to preserve this 
temporal nation for our posterity. And all of that is nothing, useless, moot, okay? For the purposes that God has for us. If any man will come after him, you want to follow Christ? You want to be officials of men? Deny yourself, take up that cross and follow him. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. The greatest thing that we could ever lose is our own life. And yet we spend all this time trying to preserve it. Our life, our lifestyle, our livelihood. Lose it. Okay, let God have care for those things. Certainly we got to provide food for families. Certainly we got to go and do a job. Certainly there's all sorts of things that need to be done. We got to do it from the position of there nothing. We hate these things for the focus of the eternal life that is to come. That's the life that I want to live. I enjoy my job, but I hate it in comparison to the work that Christ has for me promised there in heaven. For the joy that is set before me. I will endure my job. For the joy that's set before me. I'll endure cruel mockings and being lied about. For the joy that is set before me. I will endure suffering and mourning the loss of loved ones. For the joy that is set before me. All things can be endured. Even unto the death. And the end for Christians isn't always a smooth and wonderful road. It's not like Moses had where he lived out his days. God's like, the day's come and you're going to die. And best I know, he just walked out to a mountain and expired. Okay, and then there was discussion about how they're going to bury his body between Michael and, and the devil. Okay? We're not all just going to fade away in old age. We might go through some sickness. We might suffer some hurts, some pains while we're here in this world. But if we have a focus on things above, the joy that's set before us, and we're resolved that I'm dead already to this life, but alive unto God, then anything that happens here in this life, you can get through it. There's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to all men. And God will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. You can get through this. You can suffer with Christ. He's there with you. He's there to lead on. He wants to pull you through this. He wants to show you on the other end what's in chapter 17, the glory that shall be revealed. He wants to bring you through that dark place to show you the light that's on the other end. And whether that is just some pain from an illness, or whether that is unto death by persecution, the end result is the life lived, hidden in Christ Jesus, reserved there for you, eternal in the heavenlies, that new Jerusalem, that holy city, that better country. That's what's awaiting for us, and that's where we need to focus. Not on things of men, but on things of God. Follow me through suffering. And it starts with, what are you focusing on? Who are you looking to? What are you seeking after? When we get our perspective rights, the problems of this life diminish, don't they? It's true.